Okay, guys, today we're going to begin our second unit, which is going to be our unit over criminal law. Now, I gave you guys some very kind of basic information for Unit 1 about what criminal law entails. So I do want to review just a couple things real fast. You have to keep in mind, in regards to criminal law, this is when the government is bringing charges against someone accused of breaking a law that is passed by legislative branch and signed by executive branch. Now, we pass these laws in order to protect society, but even the founder said, when you are facing off against the state, you need all the protections you can get. So today, we're going to title these ones Elements of a Crime Notes. What we're going to be doing today is talking about some real basic things that are necessary to prove that, yes, you committed a crime and you broke one of these laws. Now, first off, we're going to talk about a couple of things that most crimes are going to require. You have to prove that these things existed in order to actually charge someone with a crime. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about is just the act that took place, where, yes, you broke this law and that you can prove that the action did happen. Now, you're going to see that there are a few things that we're going to point to where you can uh, see kind of the basics of our legal system is going to be from Latin phrases. The act of the crime is this Latin phrase called actus reus. You have to prove that the action did happen. Now, there's going to be another piece to this that you're going to have to prove as well. You have to prove what's called a guilty state of mind. Now, when I say this, what I mean is that the person who committed the act did in fact know what they were doing. The act was done intentionally. It was done willfully. They were of sound mind. Now, I usually kind of get questions here about, you know, did you know that this particular act was illegal? There's an old saying that says ignorance of the law is no excuse. So even if you didn't know what you were doing was a crime and you still did it, you can't say that I just didn't know. That's not going to work. Now, I also usually get a question here as far as like insanity. Now, I want to hold off on that because insanity can be a bit of a, a difficult area to explain because of what has to be proven. So if you can prove that this person did in fact do this crime intentionally, knowingly, willfully, that they were of sound mind, this is what's called the mens rea. Now again, this goes back to kind of the Latin foundation of the legal system, but this is just the idea that yes, the person committed the act, they did that crime, and they knew what they were doing. Now, I do want to build upon what mens rea includes because there are going to be kind of certain levels of awareness and also some areas where you don't necessarily need to prove what the mens rea was. Now, let me first start off with the state of mind and the level of awareness. Now, your state of mind is going to be different from the motive or the reason why you committed the act. Your motive is simply you had reasoning to do it. Now, you can kind of give you know some examples here where you say, well, you robbed the bank because you wanted the money. That's the motive. The state of mind is simply, were you aware of what you were doing? So if you rob the bank, you have to have the state of mind knowing that, yes, this is wrong, this is illegal, and you're still doing it anyway. You are of sound mind. Now, there are a few crimes that exist that are not going to necessarily require a mens rea in that you don't have to necessarily prove that this person knew that it was necessarily illegal, but also you don't necessarily have to prove that there is going to be a, a, a thought pattern that goes with it. Now, there's kind of a classic example of this, which I'm going to reference to selling alcohol to minors is what's called a strict liability offense. Now, the strict liability uh, offense is where the act itself is criminal, regardless of the state of mind. So you don't necessarily have to prove what the person, that they knew what they were doing, it was intentional, it was willful. It's just that the action of selling alcohol to minors is the crime in and of itself. Now, we're going to talk a little bit later on about more strict liability offenses, but this is kind of the classic example that's used. Now, from here, what I want to do is I want to talk about something that we discussed in Unit 1. What we're going to move on to is going to be our federalism system. 
But before we do that, I do want to outline the picture that I have for you here. Now, you might recognize it, you might not, because this actually happened several years ago. The person that you see pictured here is going to be James Holmes. He's the Aurora Theater shooting uh, a criminal who is going to be eventually proven guilty in the court. However, sitting next to him is his lawyer. What they both agree is probably their best defense is that they're going to plead insanity in that James Holmes said that he was not of state of mind, that he did not know what he was doing. Like I said, we're going to talk more about insanity going forward, but I just use this example to talk about state of mind. Now, going forward with our federalism system, I do want to remind you, this is something the founders created in order to limit government power, to decentralize power. They give a great deal of autonomy to the states and tell the states that you can create any law you want that does not conflict with federal law, which means most crimes that are exist are state crimes. So I always use this example where if you compare federal government to state government, we only have one federal government. We have 50 state governments. So each of those 50 state governments are allowed to make whatever laws they want as long as they don't conflict with federal, meaning that based on this logic, we basically have 50 times the state laws that we do for federal. Now, there are also just some areas where the federal government just allows the states to have power over certain areas. One of those is going to be the crimes that they deem important to their state. Now, I do want to give you just a few examples here of what are considered to be state laws. First one is murder. Now, we're going to talk more about the levels of homicide going forward, but murder is always a state issue. Up until really about a couple of years ago, there was no such thing as a federal murder charge. It was all left to the states. This is why the death penalty is always a state issue. Now, just about a couple of years ago, the federal government is going to decide to get back or to really re-involve themselves into some murder cases. They are few and far between, though. So the overwhelming majority of murder cases are at the state level. Now, also, I want to give you some examples here that we're going to talk more about going forward. Robbery is traditionally just a state issue. Arson or the intentional using a fire to destroy property is a state issue. Assault and mostly battery too is also a state issue. Drunk driving is a state issue as well because regulation of alcohol is also a state power. Each state has their own laws in regards to what's acceptable for alcohol consumption. Drunk driving is then considered a state issue because different states have different rules. Now, just to kind of give you an example, in Colorado, the legal limit for driving under the influence is set at 0 0.08 blood alcohol content. That's actually fairly high considering there are other states that have a considerably lower than that. In California, if I remember correctly, I believe that their blood alcohol content or BAC is set at 0 0.04. Now, of course, kind of depending on on various factors, that can be a, roughly about one beer would be 0 0.04 blood alcohol content. So different states have different rules regarding what's considered drunk driving and what is not. Now, also, it can be something as small as shoplifting. This is a state issue as well. Now, I put this other one on here to kind of give you uh, something to compare and contrast. State tax evasion is when you do not pay your state income taxes. Now, I highlight this as our last one because what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about the other side of this. We're going to go ahead and talk about some federal or national crimes. Now, federal crimes are going to include federal tax evasion. Now, I lead with this so I can kind of springboard off of where we left off. There are state income taxes that you have to pay here in Colorado, and there are federal income taxes that throughout the country everyone has to pay. So if you don't pay your Colorado taxes, you'll go to Colorado court and face the punishment for that. If you don't pay your federal taxes, you'll go to federal court, and you will in fact have to pay for that as well. Now, I bring this up because 
there is a split between what is federal crimes and what are state crimes. So I do want to give you just a few more examples for just federal crimes. Actions on federal property. You are under the federal government laws if you're on federal property. So I use this example because this happens every so often, through every year basically, where someone will be in Colorado and have possession of marijuana. Now if you're in Colorado, the Colorado law says that marijuana is legal. But if you drive into Rocky Mountain National Park, on a national park, you adhere to federal law. So no longer is marijuana legal if you're in a national park because marijuana is still federally illegal. So you can be arrested for marijuana possession even if you're in the state of Colorado in Rocky Mountain National Park because that is national federal property. You adhere to federal law there. Now also I give the example of mail fraud. There's kind of one overarching example as to when the federal government will bring charges and it's regarding crossing state lines. The mail system is kind of the easy example of information and property crossing state lines. If you defraud the mail system, then the federal government will get involved because it's not only a federal entity, the post office, but also most likely it's crossing state lines, meaning the federal government has to get involved. Same thing with drug trafficking. If you're crossing state lines, it gets very messy as to what state would charge you. So usually the federal government takes over. There will be a federal charge for drug trafficking. Now with that said, the last thing that we're going to cover is going to be when state and federal cross over. There are certain crimes that are considered to be state crimes and federal crimes, meaning that you can be charged twice for the same issue. Now, I often kind of get the question, well, isn't that double jeopardy? No, that's not double jeopardy. You're being charged at the state level and you're being charged at the federal level. Now, if you're being charged at the same level for the same crime twice, then yes, you have protection from double jeopardy. Again, this is what the founders created to protect you from the power of the state. But if you commit that crime and it's a state issue and a federal issue, then you can go to state court and or you can go to federal court. So I want to give you just a few examples of this. Possession of illegal drugs is a state issue and it's a federal issue. So I use the example of if you're in Wyoming that does not have legalized marijuana, you can be charged by the state of Wyoming and you can be charged by the federal government. Now usually the federal government is going to let the state handle something that's a smaller issue like that. But if the state can't get a conviction, the federal government can step in. They can charge you with that same crime at the federal level. Now I also give the example of bank robbery. Because banks are traditionally using, uh, they're, they're crossing state lines, but they are uh, usually chartered within that state, you can be charged with a state robbery and you can be charged federally because again, banks are using federal currency and usually their business crosses state lines. So again, if you can't get a conviction at the state level, you can charge that person with federal bank robbery. Now also I use this last one here as racially motivated murder. When you get into the issue of what's called hate crimes, when a crime is committed based on race, gender, ethnicity, etc., the federal government has stepped in and said that that's a federal power to, in fact, enforce uh, uh, hate law crimes. Now, it can get very murky as to what might be constituted as a hate crime, because like what the federal government says is, well, murder is illegal no matter what the race is. But there can be some other um, additions to penalties if it can be proven that, yes, this crime was committed because of that person's race or because of their gender. Now, this is going to wrap up the first part of our Elements of a Crime lecture. We're going to continue more as we go forward.